Welcome to Overland Park Community Church. Good to have you here with us. If it is your first time here, we're glad you're here. It feels like my first time to preach here. It's been a while. I, uh, we did the What If the Church series. Love the guys uh, uh, speaking. Blessed uh, my heart for sure. But I want to spend a little bit of time um, talking for the next week or so about vision and just thinking about the future. And we, we know look, that, that when we think in terms of spiritual vision, that um, it is a spiritual portrait that God paints on the heart of the believer of what could and should be in his kingdom. We look at um, some of the words behind the word vision in the Bible, optasia, horama, and it's, it's kind of a, you, you could put together this, this definition that it's when God starts stirring in the heart of a person and he starts moving in their lives in such a way as that he's, he's trying to bring about something in his kingdom. And so when we think in terms of uh, our church, Overland Park Community Church, we say OPCC, like what would Jesus' vision be for OPCC? Like if he came today and, and he said, hey, hey, Jimmy, I got this one, <laughs> sit down. And he took over and he taught us. What would he say to us? What would he say that he wants the church to be like? Well, it's an interesting question to think about. There are all kinds of churches. And I've been doing church, um, you know, all my life, my adult life, since I was about 22. I started full-time in ministry when I was 25 and stayed at one church for, um, you know, 15 years. Was just there and, and saw a lot of movement of the Lord. And I've seen a lot of different types of churches. Now I'm here in Overland Park doing uh, a relaunch, like revitalizing a church that was really um, on, its, on its deathbed. It, it was just declining. There were people here who loved the Lord, no doubt, but it just seemed like it couldn't get any, any traction. And, and so we've been after that and trying to dig that out now for several years. And it's, it's been quite a challenge um, to face. But when we look at um, what kind of churches there are, there there are churches that are built on what might, might be called the social gospel. So the church is um, really involved in helping the poor, um, the, the down and out, people who need ministered to, and that's good. But it's more, the church is more than just helping people socially. Um, if you help people socially and you don't teach them anything about their need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and their lives being totally turned upside down because they've had an encounter with God, you've done them no good whatsoever other than to help them to have a little bit better life on this side of eternity. But the gospel teaches that we're all headed toward this climactic event in the future. We will spend forever with the Lord, and if we don't know Him, we're going to miss out on that. So helping people socially is good, and the church should be you know, partaking in that, participating in that. It should be part of the mission to minister to people in that state of life, but it cannot be the foundation of the church. And, and if it becomes that, then we, we are like forsaking the souls of men. So we got to have that, but it's not the only thing. Then there are churches with pastors who are great communicators, and the church is built on his personality. The people love the pastor. They love the way he teaches. They love the way he brings the word. Man, when I listen to that guy, he just, man, my heart burns, and I just love that. And, and so the church can begin to grow and be built upon um, that very thing there, is that the people just love the way the word is brought forth. Um, and there's, there's good in that, but if the pastor leaves, then it can leave the church in disarray, and sometimes it can um, you know, struggle until they can find another communicator to follow. Um, but So there's some good comes from it, but still, I think, lacking. Then there are churches that are built uh, because they have great worship, and their ministry is built upon the talent of the worship leader and his ability to give an incredible experience. And then there might be what we call a a, a, a church that is built on kids ministry like the kids program is just off the chart man and, and our kids love it and that's why we go there the, the worship's not that great the the teaching's okay but man my kids love it and I love going there because I don't have to fight with my kids to go on Sunday morning and so there are churches like that and so then there are 
maybe is the super church that gets all three of those. They get the great communicator, the great worship leader, and the great kids ministry, man. And, and they just got it hitting on all cylinders, and they do a lot of good, and they reach a, a, a lot of people for the kingdom. And so all of these are great to have, but is this what Jesus sees for the church? And I must confess to you, my last church was, was built on that, that model, that last model that I described. Great worship, great teaching, um, great kids ministry, great student ministry. Offer the people what they need and they will come. And they will. And discipleship will happen in the midst of a, of a body like that, but it's sort of accidental. I, I think that if we had Jesus, if he showed up today and he spoke to us, I can tell you exactly what he would say to us is what his desire for the church is. It's found in Matthew chapter 28, and he, Matthew records it, and he tells us, as Jesus has risen from the dead, he comes back, and he's ministering, and this is the third time he has He's appeared to them, and this is the time that they get to watch him ascend back to the throne room with God. And so God the Son assumes his position in heaven with God the Father after having received his glorified body. And before he departs, he says to the eleven, he says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so Jesus says, and we know this as the Great Commission, Go make disciples. Like he doesn't say go make converts. Like converts are good. What is a convert? A convert is a person who has been impacted with the gospel and they have been converted over to the faith because they are born again. But Jesus doesn't tell us to go make converts. He tells us to go make disciples. So he says, he doesn't say go and make places for the homeless. Now, certainly he has an idea and expectation that we're going to minister to people who don't have a place to stay. He tells us that in the Gospels. We know that. But when he makes his final departure before he ascends, he says, go make disciples. And so if we're going to fulfill this commission that was given by the very one whom we claim is our Lord and Savior, and Savior meaning that he saves us from our sins, and Lord meaning that we listen to what he says, and we do it. That's what Lord means. And in the American church, what we have is we are guilty of the Savior part and claiming it and pushing the Lord part aside. But he is Lord and Savior. And as Lord, he commissions us to go and do what? Make disciples of who? All nations. And do what with them? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them everything that I have taught you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. All authority has been given to me in order to give to you, in order to you to do, to do what? To go and make disciples. Like that's it. And so we are to be a disciple-making church. And so I have to look back on my last ministry and go, man, I did a lot of things right. Like I did a lot of things right. A lot of people got discipled, but it was accidentally. Like it was as they were leading other things or it was from the stage. And I, I try to disciple from the stage by teaching you the whole counsel of the word of God and discipleship can happen that way. But I don't think that's the way it's meant to happen because that's not what Jesus showed us. It's a part of it but it's not all of it. And so we look and we go, okay, man, what, what, do, what do we need to be doing? Well, we have to ask the question, what in the world is a disciple? Like, what is a disciple? Well, it comes from um, the, the word uh, methetes. And so in the Greek, the word is methetes, and it means someone who follows another person or another way of life and who submits himself to the discipline and teaching of that leader or way, okay? Okay. 
So that's, that's what a disciple is, is that a disciple follows someone else's way of life. So who, whose way of life are we following? Well, obviously, we're following the way of the life of Jesus, but it can be difficult to acclimate all of the things that Jesus did, especially when we don't know what the heck we're doing. One of the most common questions you say when you uh, tell people, hey, man, you need to read the word. And they're like, man, I read the word, I don't understand the word. Now, certainly, you have to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and indwelling you for you to be able to comprehend the Word. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to illuminate the Scripture for us. He teaches us. He guides us into all truth. But in the midst of Him teaching us and guiding us into all truth, like it can be difficult for us to um, develop that rhythm of being in the Word, sitting before the Father, like falling. Brent talked about like falling on your face before the Lord. How do I do that? Do I just go in a room somewhere and just lay down face forward and just lay on the ground? Am, am I doing it then? <laughs> and so there are a lot of things that can be confusing within the kingdom. So when we, come, when we think about what it means to follow Jesus and to be a disciple, there is a way for us to experience and learn and acclimate um, all of the rhythms that he um, lived out here on the planet while he was here. So, so when he says, go and make disciples, there's an expectation of the guys that he's been talking to and living with and, and doing life with for, the, for, for three consecutive years, like he intentionally poured into them. Why? So that they could intentionally pour into others. And there were people beyond the 12. There were 70 that he sent out. And he sent them out two by two, and they were to go out, and they were to take the message of the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews. And, and they went out, and they experienced the things that he had been showing them, and he had been doing with them for three years. And so we, we look at this, and we see that disciples are lifelong learners and followers of Jesus. And it doesn't happen by accident. It is an intentional pursuit. Like, you're sitting here, and you're listening to me, and you come every week. You're not accidentally going to get disciples. Like, if you're going to get discipled, it must be an intentional pursuit on your part and on the part of someone else in order for you to develop and become the person that Jesus wants you to be, in order to fulfill all that he has for you to fulfill as a disciple of Christ. And so he calls us to go and make disciples, and then he brings us together in the body of Christ in order that that might take place. Mike Breen has written a lot about discipleship, and he says this, and I agree with it. If you make disciples, you always get at the church but if you make a church you rarely get a disciple you get a consumer like you get people who come in they feast they get their fix on Jesus that's why they follow great communicators and great worship oh man I was just blessed by God then they go out the world beats them to death they feel like they're going to fall apart again they come in on Sunday boom I got to get another fix and they become addicts of Jesus instead of disciples of Jesus so we should be going out into the world looking for people whom God has called us to minister to. And because we have created a place of consumerism, people are coming in and getting a fix. And I, I'm not like blaming anybody if you're doing that. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just telling you it's the nature of what has been created in, in America today. It's this, this consumerism. And, and so because this, this thing called discipleship is hard. Like it's difficult. Um, it's slow. It's not like, hey, man, we're going to introduce this thing. We're going to blow it up. And man, we're going to be running uh, two or 300 people in, 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 you know, in six or eight months. And, and it's, so it's very intentional. It requires commitment on the people of God. It requires commitment on the person who is going to disciple. But, but we look and we see, man, J Jesus said, what did he say? Go and make disciples. Now, what's cool about this whole thing is that, Jesus created a highly supportive but highly challenging culture. So there was no doubt that Jesus challenged you, man. Like he, the, the, the rich young man ran up to Jesus and he was like, hey, Jesus, like, man, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And he said, man, you, you need to, uh, you know, love your neighbor, honor your parents, love God. Man, I've been doing that all my life. He said, well, then go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the young man bowed his hat, head and he walked away like broken and, and depressed. Why? Because he had a lot of money. And what was Jesus doing? He was challenging that dude. Man, he was stepping into that dude's life. And Jesus did that. But he also supported people. 
Like, like he was always creating this loving environment that had a whole lot of challenge, but had a whole lot of love in it. And he consistently was walking in that rhythm with people and ch- with a high challenge and a high level of support. In uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, we have this, this one of my favorite passages of scripture where Jesus talks about um, being yoked up with him. Like, like if, if it, or, you know, are you, is, your, is your burden like heavy? And yoke up with me. And in the message, which is a, a paraphrase of the scripture, um, he, Eugene Peterson writes this, and I think it's great. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Come on, man. That's what I want. I don't want to live in such a way that I'm feeling pressure all the time. How am I going to get this church to grow? I got to get this done. I got to get that done. That is not what Jesus is saying right here. Jesus is not saying to me that my life is all to be wrapped up in the pursuit of things and money and deadlines and and stuff. He's saying, man, come learn from me and I'll show you how to live freely, how to live light. I'm looking at that and I'm going, man, that's what I want right there. That is what I need in my life. That's the way I want to spend however many years the Lord gives me. That's the way I want to live them, freely and lightly, with the un, um, the, the, uh, uh, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. <laughs> Man, come on, like I, like, I want that. I want unforced rhythms of grace. Like, I don't want to have to force grace into my life because I feel shame all the time. I just want the unforced rhythms of grace to come in, and I'm just like walking in grace, and people I'm encountering are going, man, there's a dude right there that has, he's walking freely and lightly. Something's going on in his life. I need some of that. And as they ask me about what is going on in my life and they observe my life from a distance, I want them to be able to see that I'm living freely and lightly because I've been walking and working with Jesus and I'm walking so closely that he has taught me how to do it. And, and I, uh, like, man, like, that's how I'm living. Uh, that's how I'm living right now. I got to my last church and I wasn't living like that. Like that thing grew and it built and, and the Lord did a work there and people were coming to Christ and, 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 you know, lives were being changed and we had success. But I got to a point where I was not living freely and lightly any longer. And, and I, like I look at that and I was like, man, I, I don't want to live like that. I want to live free and light. I want, to, I want to walk in the unforced rhythms of the grace of God. I want to be around people and I want to do life with them and I want them to experience the Lord that I know and I, I want them to experience the life that I know and I, I want to walk and, and just live my life in such a way that, that God is getting all the glory but I'm having a blast in the midst of it. Like, for God to get glory in our lives doesn't mean that we have to be miserable. As a matter of fact, if we're miserable, God's not getting any glory. Like, he's, he says to us, even in our suffering, that he, he can come in the midst of that, and somehow joy can be created in the midst of that, because it is a spiritual thing that God does in our lives when we're walking with him in the unforced rhythms of grace. This is a picture of biblical discipleship. Like, this is it. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. That is a biblical picture of what Jesus was talking about when he said to those guys and he ascended back to heaven, go and make those. (laughs) That's what he wants us to do. And so how can we make those if we don't even know how to be one of those? Well, we better figure out how to be one of those. And as we figure out how to be one of those, it will be something that happens in our life. It's like, I don't want anything else. Man, one of the, here's how I ended up in ministry. I didn't like go, hey, man, uh, I think I would like to be a public speaker, and I think I'd be pretty good at it. And so I think I'll just like, how about a preacher? Like, that'd be a good way to make a living. And <laughs> like, that's not what happened. 
Like what happened for me is I was following in love with the Lord. The Holy Spirit was doing a work in my life. And as the Holy Spirit was doing that work in my life, like I, I couldn't believe what was happening. I couldn't believe the joy I was experiencing. I couldn't believe what the Lord was doing in and around and through me. And because of that, like I just kept talking to the Lord about it. And as I kept talking to the Lord about it and sharing with other people, I, I couldn't believe the growth that was taking place in me. And the more I shared it, the more it felt like I grew. And so then before I knew it, like within 60 days of me recommitting my life to the Lord, I, I had was giving my testimony. I'd never spoken in front of a group of people before. I got up and started speaking and, and the Lord just like, he used me. He just like, I spoke for 30 minutes. It was like the easiest thing I'd ever done. The Lord, like everything that was in me just started coming out. And, and I was talking 900 miles an hour. You think I talk fast right now, man. I would go through 12 pages of note, just <laughs> people were like, what? And like, I, what, could you slow down just a bit, bro? And, and, and so like, but it was coming out of me. And, and after I did it, I was like, whoa, man, this feels so good. And that, that started leading a, a, a smaller group of teenagers. And as I would lead with them and share them and work in their lives and, and see them like develop in the Lord, then it made me like, it just, it helped me. Like I just, what is going on? And so I just kept digging deeper and deeper into the church. And before I knew it, like I was sharing my life and walking with people and, and people were growing. And every time they said they were growing, I would grow a little bit more. And I just, like, I just kept filling up with what? Jesus said, man, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy your life. But I've come what? To give you life abundantly. I was walking in the abundant life. And so that when we, when we do that, like, man, and that's how I ended up in ministry. And that's why I lead people today. It's, it's, it's not because I think it's a great career choice. It's because the Lord, one, called me, and two, my life is full. I don't need a lot of money because I got a lot of Jesus. And, and you could, it, there's a lot of people who got a lot of money and don't have any Jesus, and I guarantee it, I'm a lot happier than they are because I'm walking in the fullness of the Lord. And so I, I, like my, my identity is wrapped up in Jesus. So when we look at this and we see this as a picture of biblical discipleship and we go, okay, walking and working with Jesus, how do we do that physically without the physical Jesus present? How does one do that? Like we can look at the, the New Testament and go, okay, I get it. Jesus was with these guys and he was pouring into them. And man, they were, they were walking with him and they were seeing him do incredible things. They were seeing him do the rhythms of life. But Jesus is not here anymore. So how do we do that physically without the physical Jesus present? Well, he is present. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, Paul tells us this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the people for the works of service so that the body of Christ, underline that, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So he's, like we, he says, so that the body may be built up, so that we may mature in the fullness of the, me in the measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And so we see here that we are the physical body of Christ on the planet. I am the body of Christ. If you know Jesus, you are the body of Christ. So how do we learn the unforced rhythms of grace and learn how to live freely and lightly as Jesus described and and how do we learn that from him? How do we walk with him? How do we work with him? Well, we, if we're going to do it, we have to be with the body. We have to be with the body of Christ. And who is the body of Christ? You and I. If we know him, we are the body of Christ. So as we gather around the word with the spirit, we are the body of Christ to each other. So when I am, like right now, 
you are hearing from the body of Jesus. I am the eyes, I am the lips, I am the ears, I am the, the feet of Christ. Any believer who knows Christ is the body of Christ. Do you not know that your temple is um, the, uh, the, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God lives in you? And so now your body becomes the presence of God here on the planet. And so the, how do we walk with the Lord? How do, we, how do we get discipled without the physical Jesus here? Is the physical Jesus is here in the form of other human beings who are following hard after him. And so Jesus said that he was going to make a church and that it would be so incredible that the gates of hell would not stop it. Then he said, as he left his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and make methetes. Go and make those people who do the way of life the way that I have taught you how to do the way of life. Just as I have walked with you, I want you to walk with others. And as you walk with others, they will develop the unforced rhythms of grace and they will become mature in the fullness of Christ, no longer being infants tossed back and forth and being taken advantage of by all the schemes of the crafty people around you. I mean, that's, like, that's a picture, that, that, that toss back and forth of infancy and the schemes of crafty people, that is a picture of the world in which we live. And, and what is sad is that there are so many who are part of the body of Christ that are being tossed back and forth and, we, and by waves and winds of doctrine and schemes and they're just all over the place and there's no steady fullness of the measure of Jesus in their lives. They haven't learned how to, to, to walk in the unforced rhythms of grace. And I don't think it's because they don't want to. I think it's because they don't know how to. And so what does Jesus say? He says, go and make disciples. You see, discipleship produces the types of people we see in the word. So we ought to be able to look at our lives and go, I look like I could be one of the people that are in the word. Not meaning from the standpoint of, oh, look at us, we're incredibly amazing people. No, we, we live like the people we find in the word. We go, man, I, I live like King David lived. I, I, I have the unforced rhythms of his life. I see how he, um, how he walks with the Lord. I, I live like Peter does. I live like James does. I live like John does. I live like Paul does. I live like, um, you know, uh, all of these different people that we see in the Bible. Why do we live like them? Because they live like Jesus. And so we ought to be able to be right on the pages of Scripture with the same rhythms of life. That's what discipleship produces. Why is it important? Let me give you a few things in closing because I know you're going, my goodness, this dude has talked all his time up and there's like eight blanks. We're coming quick, all right? Just points for us to talk about. Why is discipleship important? Because it's what Jesus did. I just, I don't need to say anything else. Why is it important? That's what Jesus did. Why else is it important? Because that's what Jesus told us to do. Jesus told us to go and make disciples. So if you are not a disciple who's walking in the full measure of Christ, then you haven't done what Jesus has told you to do. If you are a disciple who understands the full measure of Christ and you know how to walk in the rhythms of grace and you're not intentionally discipling somebody else right now, you're not doing what Jesus told us to do. That's okay because you might be like, I don't even know how to do that. I don't even know what that means. I don't know what that looks like. That's okay. But what's not, what's not okay is right now you know. Like if you're not doing it, you know. Because I'm trying to really push hard and be a church, not that a church is just all about reaching and helping people socially. Not a church is built on my personality. Not a church is built on Brent's personality. Not a church is built on the kids' ministry, but a church that is built on the disciples of Christ. So that if, if I go away, the church is fine. If Brent goes away, the church is fine. If you go away, you are fine. Why? Because you have been equipped fully 
with the things that God has given us to go and make disciples. You're no longer an infant being tossed back by every wave of doctrine and the craftiness of the schemes of people and you have been invested in and poured into and so now you are walking out in the unforced rhythms of grace and living freely and lightly. It doesn't matter where we put you, the church will go there. And so one of the things like people like go to a, a new town and they move away from their church. And one of the most difficult things is finding a church that was like my last church. I just can't find it. Well, if you are your last church, wherever you go, your last church is going. Now, so we come together and we build each other up. I said, well, it, it's what Jesus told us to do because it teaches us to know Jesus and not just know about him. Like we need to know him. We need to be able to sit with the Lord, hear his voice, take the word and, and, and the Holy Spirit prompting us and spend some time in prayer and just listen to what God wants us to do, what he, where he wants us to go, how he wants us to live, who he wants us to call. You see, the Lord will prompt us in ways that absolutely blow us away if we would learn how to listen. And so it teaches us how to do that, to not just know about Jesus, but to know him because Sunday morning is not enough. You will never be discipled and, and, and turn into the disciple that Jesus wants you to be if you only rely on what you're getting here on Sunday morning. It's just not going to happen. Like, there's got to be more than what is happening on our weekly gathering. This is a crucial piece of it. Don't get me wrong. Like, and, and faithfulness to it is very important, but the, it is not enough to disciple you in Christ because it keeps us off high center. Man, people will go through a Bible study and like, man, I, I, sometimes I'd be talking to a, 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 it's been so common to talk to a, a lady in the church um, over the years and go, man, I just need to get in another Beth Moore Bible study. I'm stuck. You're on high center. You don't need another Beth Moore Bible study. You need to know how to sit with Jesus so that you could write studies like Beth Moore does. And that's why Beth Moore is making all the money that she's making on those Bible studies because the Lord is using her. Why? Because she has been discipled by someone and she has learned the unforced rhythms of grace and she's sharing that with other women. But what we don't need is another Bible study. What we need is people who know how to listen to the Lord for themselves, take the word, sit with other people and see the body grow. That's what we need. And if you if 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 you are relying on Bible study, again, I'm not anti Beth Moore or anti Bible study. What I'm saying is, is that we like those things will allow us to continually get on high center and we get stuck. But if we get in discipleship and we go through discipleships ourselves and we learn these rhythms, and then we start doing that with others, then we're not going to get hit on high center. Why? Because we're going to be doing what Jesus did. And as we're doing what Jesus did, it puts us in a place where we want to talk to him about what is going on in our lives. And we see that it's the most important thing that we're participating in because it is, um, it, it is eternal. And so we, we do it because it helps us keep, keep from getting stuck. Uh, because it's fun and it builds spiritual family. Like discipleship is just fun. It, it, I think it's very important to say, to go back to what Jesus was saying, and I say this is a picture of discipleship. He says, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. I, I'm going to challenge you, but I'm not going to lay anything heavy and ill-fitting. I'm going to lay something light on you that whenever you step into it, you're going to experience the freedom that comes from following and getting on the right side of obedience with me. Listen, when we meet the Lord and we give our lives to him, and we, we step out in obedience to do that, and we say, man, I, I have become a follower of Jesus. It doesn't stop there. There are things that I constantly have to step into on obedience, and if I don't sit with other people and have other people in my life that I'm discipling um, or, or that I'm in a group myself where I'm getting discipled, then there's no way that I'm going to be able to continually grow. But when I'm in there, man, I, I start like developing relationships, and the depth of my relationships becomes something that, it's like family. Like, it's just like, man, I love these people. I love them. And so people that I have walked with in this church, people that I've walked with outside of this church, people that I've really been close to and we've centered ourselves on the word, now I love them. I care about them. And I want to know them, not just what they do. And, 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 and so, like, we look at that and we go, man, 
this, this is the power of the Lord, and it creates spiritual family. And, and then finally, because when we make disciples, we will, we will reach people who don't know Jesus. Like when you make disciples, you're just going to reach people who don't know the Lord. And you're going to reach them in a way that they can receive it and take the Lord into their lives and follow hard after him because there's going to be relationship tied to it. Now, I just, I, I just keep getting blown away by the power of discipleship. And I, I'll give you the big idea. Discipleship is the plan of Jesus. Like that's just what it is. I, uh, I think it's ironic I got a call this, this morning um, way back several years ago at my last church. I had to let somebody go that was on staff. I mean, that's no fun. And it's, it's, it's difficult to do in the secular world. It's doubly difficult in the, in the kingdom because you got people who are tied to that individual in the church. You're tied to them. You love them. And it is just a hard thing to do because it's so relational and you're trying to live like Jesus. And it, it just, man, it's tough. A lot of times, it, it, it's just a challenging thing. And so anyway, this individual, I had to let them go. They were kind of just like, man, it, it, it was tough for them. It was tough for me. Well, they have gone back to my old church. And I, I knew that. And this was a long time ago, so several years have passed. And and they just kind of recently, I think, started attending back there. And I sent the pastor, it was a guy who was in D group with me, invited me into a, a discipleship group. He went back to my old church, and he's the pastor there now. And so he's been discipling people, and there's discipleship groups started. And this person is in one of, uh, I think it's in his wife's group. And so she called me this morning, and this is what discipleship does. When I'm talking about getting you off high center. She said, Jimmy, I... I just want to talk to you. Like, I'm going to share my Jesus story tonight in discipleship group. And, uh, like, just looking back on that whole experience, I've been bitter toward you for all these years. And I need to forgive you. You made the right call. Like, it was the right call. It was hard. It was painful. And, but I've been, I've, like, I've been bitter. And, I, and so I talked to her. And I was like, man, you know, I, I love you. I'm proud of you for calling me. I'm so thankful that you're in a group. And I'm so thankful for how God's going to use you in that ministry. And she asked me, she said, I don't know if you ever think about it before she started. She said, you, you know, you may not ever think about it or not. And I think about it all the time. Like, I think about it all the time is what I told her. And I'm so thankful that you, like, are, are talking to me about this. Without discipleship. She probably never makes the call. What she has stepped into, friends, is freedom. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come to give life and give it abundantly. The unforced rhythms of grace that we might live free and lightly. And so that's what discipleship does. It helps us to go places we would never go without it. It helps me do the same thing. And I've been walking with the Lord all my adult life. What I'm telling you is that discipleship is that powerful, is so powerful that I understand I need it in my own life. Like I need to be walking with guys. And as I walk with them and I'm working to teach them the unforced rhythms of grace, the Lord just keeps teaching me more. And so I rely on it not only to advance the kingdom, but the kingdom is being advanced in me. And that's the way it works. Why? Because all the parts of the body are doing their work. They're coming together. And we're growing up into the full measure of the fullness of, of Christ. No longer as infants being tossed back and forth. But we are now fulfilling the work of the body. And so here, as we land, I want to give you just to have a heart to heart about discipleship. Because like a message like today, you'd be like, man, I, I'm, I'm, sign me up. Sign me up. Hopefully you're there. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have been invited. And I know some of you are inviting others to walk with you. Okay, so like I wanted, like I felt the Lord just saying to me, you need to talk about discipleship. Because like, probably some of the people are like, what's going on here, man? Um, and so I just felt a prompting from the Lord to, to share this message. 
I will say to you, this is a process and it takes time. It takes, it takes about a year to walk people through this. It's not fast. It's not like, hey, here's a curriculum. It's life. It's life on life. And so it takes time. Um, and here's a big one. You may not get invited the first round. And that's okay. It's okay. doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. doesn't mean that somebody might be more popular than you are. doesn't mean that at all. Like it, what it means is like, it's going to take time. We can't disciple everybody at the same time. And so the Lord is just going to do what he's going to do, and people are going to go through this thing, and, and, and don't, like, don't, don't, don't let the devil steal something from you by telling you, you, you know, you're not good enough, that's why you didn't get selected. Or those people are clicky and they like each other better. That's not what's going on. What's going on is the Lord is trying to do a work of discipleship in our church and we're trying to break the mold and be something different. What are we trying to be? What Jesus wants us to be. Um, if you haven't been invited, you should pray about being invited. Like just start taking it to the Lord um, so that you can see the Lord bring together what he wants to do. Uh, this is scary for the people at OPCC who are making their first stab at this. Like the people who are, I've released and, and, and they're out like inviting others. It's terrifying for them. I know it is. Like they've never done anything like this. But the, the, what's so amazing, and I'm not going to give any names, is, but I can tell you stories of those who are stepping into it. The freedom in their lives is undeniable. And it has nothing to do with me. And I like look at them and I go, man, they're living like, they're living like I'm living. Like they're, they're experiencing what I'm experiencing. And they're going through these ups and downs, but they're going on this journey with the Lord. And, and the Lord is just breaking out in freedom all over their lives. And so this is, this is scary for those guys. So they need you to pray for them. They need you to encourage them. And, and if you get invited, they really need you to take it to the Lord and think about, am I supposed to do this? Like, is the Lord calling me? Because the people that are asking you are doing it because they feel like the Lord is prompting them to do it. And so it's a beautiful thing that's going on here. Um, and so I just end with this. What could be? A church full of disciple-making disciples. Not people leading Bible studies and acting like professors. Just people loving each other, hanging out, doing life. And letting Jesus do his thing in us. Being the hands and feet, the eyes, the ears, being the body to each other. It's going to take some time, okay? But as we're committed to it, the Lord can do something that is so amazing that when we're all dead, it could still be happening. Like it could, and the church doesn't die because the people are doing what? What they're supposed to be doing. Should it be? There's no doubt. It's what Jesus wanted.